Whether you're looking for answers to specific life questions or simply hoping to become the best version of you possible, welcome to the Mental Breakdown and Psych Reg podcast, where we offer insight, information, and strategies based upon research and years of practice as psychologists. So sit back, have a listen, and get connected with our hosts, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall. Welcome back. This week, we're going to continue some of our conversations about the relationship between mental illness, mental health issues, right. and violence. Right. Because th- there's been the, the ongoing conversations, mm-hmm. uh, we'll call them conversations, uh, ab- with, as it relates to gun violence and uh, mass shootings and things like that, continues. Uh, and, and, you know, Richard, I, I've watched, or, or I've not watched, I haven't watched any news, but I've listened to a lot of podcasts and, right. and, and things. And exactly what we were saying, um, the first time we recorded after the, sh- the, the shooting on the, si- the 14th was that Friday. We recorded that Friday, uh, February 16th, for our Saturday podcast. And it was in that podcast, I think, was when we said, something feels different about this, right. this mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what everybody keeps saying. Right. Everybody keeps saying there's something different about this one. And and I read this morning that uh, a lot of governors are coming out and saying that they are interested in talking about, um, you know, law, different gun laws and and, right. and gun control and things. So mm-hmm. maybe mm-hmm. something is different. Right. There was something different from the beginning. And then when the students started speaking out mm-hmm. and 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 uh, on the news when they would be interviewed, some of them were quite eloquent, mm-hmm. um, articulate about. Their fears, their legitimate fears about the, you know, we have to stop. Some somebody has to stop this, mm-hmm. and they're pleading with adults right. um, to stop it. The other thing we said was that we don't want to rush to interventions, right. and that was the second point that we made. That um, immediately we had people calling for the resignation of the FBI director. Mm-hmm. Well, um, and now we have um, Governor Scott has come out with a list of recommendations mm-hmm. of things they're going to do, and he said he he claim he says he he reported that. Uh, this is a, a group, a committee of stakeholders, mm-hmm. educators, police mm-hmm. officers, etc. Well, it's only been a couple of days, and and you can't do that kind of thorough right. um, problem solving right. in just a couple of days. And then today, I looked at the news, and now they're calling for the Broward County Sheriff to resign. You know, the mm-hmm. politicians in in mm-hmm. Florida. Uh, in Tallahassee are calling for the resignation of the Broward County Sheriff. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And these are these are political decisions. They're not safety decisions. Right. They're not gun issues. They're not mental health issues. These are politically driven issues. It makes it look like we're doing something. And, and I think that that's the point. The, the point is, is that we feel as though we have to do something. And it, it's it's almost as though we know that if something's not done within the first week or two weeks, right. everybody's well, going, all of our attention is going to shift and then nothing's going to be done. Right, right. Um, because we know that after about a couple of weeks, our our, um, our conversations, the news mm-hmm. and shifts to something different. Right. And we're no longer thinking about uh, That's right. that. So No, I think that uh, there the, the two things that I think we need to be careful of is, one is these should never be uh, political decisions. Mm-hmm. It, it, uh, no matter who the poli- whether it's a governor or a legislature, mm-hmm. and doesn't matter whether it's state or federal, stop calling for the resignation of people. It may be that in the end, a person is deemed to be inadequate right. or incompetent or something. But let's not start with the assumption that somebody did something wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's plenty of there's plenty of blame to go around. Okay, and the second thing is we don't want to just come up with a with a very um, a neat what you referred to as a knee-jerk response. Right, right. You know, we, we did that with Columbine when we did zero tolerance, mm-hmm. and it was a monumental failure. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that now. So the, the, the other thing is let's not come up with a knee-jerk response. Mm-hmm. And the third thing is everything has to be on the table. Mm-hmm. So when, when people say, well, well, well gun, gun control isn't going to be on the table, right. why not? Okay. Right. Why, why should mental health and not gun... All these issues are complex. So everything has to be on the table. Everything has to be up for discussion if we're going to come up with effective interventions. Right. If you just want to do something to make it look like you're doing something, that that's one thing. But if you really if you really mm-hmm. want to solve this complex problem, um, you, you have to put everything on the table. Right. 
So, so, and, and we talked about a lot of that last week. Right. And so mm-hmm. this week we're going to sort of spend a little bit more time focusing sort of specifically on, on some mental right. health concerns right. mm-hmm. because uh, of all of the things, all of the issues that we reviewed last week, I, I think that the issue of mental illness and mental health is getting the most focus. It keeps recurring, you know, right. and, and, and I think the phrase that you most often hear is, how do we keep guns out of the hands of people with mental illness? Right. I, I think that's the, that's right. what everybody's talking about. And so that's what we're going to, we're going to, we're going right. to focus on that one today. Um, and, and over the course of the week, we're going to talk about, again, just some, some nuances that I mm-hmm. think, that we think are really important for people right. to consider and to think about when, before just saying we should restrict people with mental illness from having a gun, I think that there's some nuances that we really have to consider mm-hmm. because, um, you know, I don't know that everybody that says that knows what knows what mental illness is. That's right. And, and That's the right. difference between mental illness and symptoms and uh, and environmental things. And so I think and environmental we're stressors. Talk about. You right. know, we talk about the stress diathesis model in right. psychology. Well. You can have environmental stressors that lead you to make bad decisions mm-hmm. that have nothing to do with mental right. illness. Okay? Right. So um, we do know about much that I don't know about gun control. I'm not mm-hmm. a Second Amendment constitutional scholar, so right. there's a lot that I don't know about that. But we do know about this mental health issue. Right. So before, so what all we want to do is let's let's investigate, let's take apart this issue of keeping guns out of the hands of right. people with mental illness. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, so let's, um, let's talk then very quickly about what it means, what, mm-hmm. what it would mean to, if we kept the hands out of anyone with a mental illness. Kept guns out kept of the hands. guns out of the hands of anyone with a mental illness. That's right. Let's start with that. that okay. That's the, sort of the broad topic. That's what everybody's asking for. Let's, let's see what that means. Okay. Mm-hmm. So we know that, and, and we've talked about this in previous podcasts, right. The, the DSM, has, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, what, right. what the American Psychiatric Association has published as sort of the, the diagnostic reference tool mm-hmm. um, that most mental health professionals and insurance companies and everything else mm-hmm. uses to, to make diagnoses of various mental health conditions. Um, and so that book contains what we refer to as mental illnesses right. and, and the diagnostic criteria for those. The, the, the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual came out in 1952. Two. Okay. Um, f- over the c- course of the last 65 years or so, mm-hmm. um, well, we'll just say 60 years because the most recent edition came out in, two, in 2013. 2013. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we have gone from 106 diagnoses right. in the DSM mm-hmm. to well over 300 diagnoses in the DSM-5. That's right. Mm-hmm. So in, over the course of 60 years, mm-hmm. let's say 50 before, I meant 60 years. Over mm-hmm. the course of 60 years, our, our the number of diagnoses that we're making has more than doubled. More than doubled, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, well, it's actually more than, it's about tripled. Triple, right. Right. And in, and in the, the last edition, they tried to keep the number of um, uh, unique diagnoses down. Right. They collapsed, for example, they right. collapsed uh, mm-hmm. autism from five to one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it could be much larger than, right. than 300, but, but they made an effort to limit the mm-hmm. number of new diagnoses. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so we have many more diagnoses than mm-hmm. we had just 50 or 60 years ago. And we have many more people who are meeting diagnostic criteria for them. Right. Now, whether that's because of, of simply because of population growth right. or whether that's because we are getting better at identifying Right. More people are seeing physicians than they did in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. Not sure why, but we are seeing a significantly um, a significant increase in the prevalence of most mental health conditions. That's right. And and it may just be that people are going to mental health professionals mm-hmm. now, and they didn't 50 right. years ago. Right. Um, my parents didn't go to professionals. Right. We do. My generation right. does. Mm-hmm. Okay, so. And, and if we use autism that you just right. mentioned a moment ago, you know, in the 1950s. Mm-hmm. It was a relatively rare right. diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Um, few people um, met criteria, which is which is why you know in the '80s when Rain Man, the movie right. Rain Man came out, it, it was it was so profound because 
relatively few people had heard about autism. And in the 1950s and 60s, um, kids didn't go to school. Right. I mean, if you had a handicapping condition, if you couldn't get into the building, if you couldn't right. do the regular curriculum, you just didn't go to school. You right. either stayed at home or you went to a center. <clears throat> so you weren't counted. Right, because mm -hmm. remember, special education and stuff <clears throat> didn't really come about until the 1960s mid -70s. and 70s. Yeah, it came out in the mid-70s. And so there was no way to count these kids because right. you didn't know you didn't know that they existed because they weren't in public schools. Right. Now they are in public schools, so they're easier to count. Okay. Right. It could also be that neonatology. You mm -hmm. know, in the 1950s and 60s, if you weighed less than three pounds, your chances of survival were pretty small. Right. Now uh, you can be a pound, and we right. can we can keep you alive and, and vibrant and help. You know, uh, you can live a long life. Right. Um, and so there are many contributing factors, but mm -hmm. yes, there's more mental illness. And in many cases, the symptoms are more severe. Right, right, right. Okay. So, so whereas <clears throat> autism was a relatively rare condition, mm -hmm. you know, 50 or 60 years ago, you know, the most recent uh, update that we saw was what, one in 66? That's still an um, alarming number. So, so more than 1% of the right. population would meet criteria for autism. And same thing with ADHD. ADHD you know, what, in some areas is up to 11%. Right. If you look at the Southeast, mm -hmm. um, much higher rate, very, right. very high rates of uh, ADHD. Right. But the example that I think is important for us to use when it, when it comes to this is, um, it is to, because we, we've talked before about, about 20% of the population would right. meet criteria for something. Okay. Right. So that, that number. Okay. So, but I'm sure that people who hear 20% of the population, yeah, but some of those people, you know, it's just mild depression. It's just mm -hmm. this, it's just that. Granted. All right. So let's take a condition that's pretty significant that I think that most people, if they just heard the word, <clears throat> would say that a person with that condition should not own a gun. Right. Okay? Yeah. Of, of all these mental illnesses, right. uh, which one would you say this is the one? that nobody with this condition should have a gun because it's so serious. Right. It's, these people are so impaired and they're so potentially dangerous. Mm -hmm. Okay. They should never get a gun. Right. 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 And, and, and the example, mm -hmm. the, the, the diagnosis that most often comes up is schizophrenia. Schizo right. Because schizophrenia is a thought disorder. Now, we're, we're generalizing here. There are a lot of people who, who have schizophrenia who, who are not significantly Doing impaired. Yeah. You know, they, they're able to, to work and function and with medication. They, they do just fine to manage right. their symptoms. Mm -hmm. However, when you think about schizophrenia and schizophrenia spectrum disorder, so mm -hmm. there, there's a number of disorders that fall within that broad mm -hmm. category. We're talking about estimated to be about 1% of the population. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, so about 1% of the population <clears throat> meets criteria for one of the schizophrenia spectrum disorders. Spectrums, right. So it could be schizophrenia mm -hmm. or schizoaffective disorder. Um, it, even some of the delusional disorders and some of those other things would fall right. within that broad spectrum. Okay, so 1% of the population. How many people are in the United States? 300 million. Okay, 1% of 300 million <clears throat> is 3 million. 3 million. Okay. Can we imagine... Could you imagine a, a, a rule, a ruling, um, and, and now that's 300 million people. Um, schizophrenia is a disorder that primarily affects adults. Right. So if we if we took out children, 50 um, million. We'd so we're a, still talking about 250 million. 250. People. So we're talking about 2.5 million to 3 million, million people right. with um, with schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine a rule of some sort? that would say that three million people would be the, the right to um, the Second Amendment, right. as, as people would say, <clears throat> right. that mm -hmm. the, the right to the Second Amendment uh, opinion would be removed um, from three million people. Yeah, imagine the United States Congress. Paul Ryan gets up and says, okay, beginning tomorrow, mm -hmm. beginning March 1st, mm -hmm. uh, two and a half million people have just lost their Second Amendment right. Right. Okay. I don't care what you think about the Second Amendment, but right. that's not the issue. The issue is that we come up with a ruling that says, this is the most severe mental illness. Mm -hmm. Two and a half million people have it, and we're going to exclude them. We're going to mm -hmm. deny them. Right. What would be the response? Right. It, it would be pretty significant, and, <clears throat> and rightfully so. And rightfully so. Because, again, if we're just looking at the numbers, mm -hmm. how many mass shootings were there in 2017? 300 340 340 around 350 okay 
350 <laughs> mass shootings, mm -hmm. 3 million people with schizophrenia. Right. How many people, how many of the people with schizophrenia, how many people who did a mass shooting suffered from schizophrenia? This, the, the proportion is extremely small. I don't know that any, only 7.5% of these shootings are attached to people with mental illness. That were identified as mentally ill before. But it was so, any mental illness. Right. right. So, the, the, <clears throat> so the point is, is that if, if the, the worst mental illness, that the, the most impairing mm -hmm. mental illness that we can think of is schizophrenia, and that affects 3 million people in the United States, um, and there were 350 um, mass shootings in 2017, right. and none of them that I remember hearing about. I don't think any of them were. None of them were diagnosed with schizophrenia. Why would we blame schizophrenia? Right. And why would we why would we focus <clears throat> on saying, you know, these people because they have a really serious severe mental illness, mm -hmm. those people should have their rights taken away. That's right. And. You know, I, again, I said earlier, I'm not a constitutional scholar, right. but I love the I love the Constitution. Mm -hmm. I, I love the amendments. The, I like the first ten. Nobody disagrees with that. We should have these guarantees. When you step on to, you know, we just had the Olympics, mm -hmm. and I look at those those skateboarder uh, skateboarders. What are they called? Bobsleds. No, the the single board. Uh, snow, uh, snowboard. Snowboards. Okay, they stand at the top of that mm -hmm. enormous mountain. Mm -hmm. That's a slippery slope. Yeah, and I think of if you deny a group one of these t first ten amendments, mm -hmm. the, one of these the, of the Bill right. of Rights. Okay, if you deny a group for whatever reason, mm -hmm. you're entering that slippery slope. Yeah, because what if next year we decide to? Well, I think we should bar this group right. or this group. or the, You can't start. I mean, we've seen this at work in other countries. We mm -hmm. saw it in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. You were Jewish, so you were denied certain right. rights because the leaders of Germany at the time said, well, Jews are the enemy. They're the problem. So we're going to deny them their rights to right. private property and ownership and eventually their lives. Okay? Right. So they were denied those basic rights. To be exceedingly careful mm -hmm. about denying any group one of these basic rights. Whether it's freedom of speech or freedom to own a gun, that's not right. the issue. Um, and, but you're right. The, the second issue is this is the most severe of all the mental illnesses. But clearly, it's not the reason. Mm -hmm. It's not the explanation for school shootings. Right. Okay. So that's issue number one when it comes to mental illness. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so we have to <clears throat> we have to be cautious. We have to be. You know, when when you when we're talking about mental illness mm -hmm. and we're talking about the relationship between mental illness and violence, I, I I think that we can say that there are some with mental illness that have a propensity to become violent. Certainly, that is a minority right. of those with a, with a mental illness, and right. and and I think that that <clears throat> that next piece is the piece that we forget to to right. to mention yeah. because. Just because a person has a mental illness doesn't mean that they become violent. Right. And just because a person is violent doesn't mean that they have a mental illness. That's right. And so we're, we're using faulty logic right. to try to, to explain this. And again, I, 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 I'm going to go back to the knee-jerk mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> thing. Right. That it's an easy thing to look at because mm -hmm. when, when, when a person looks at some of these horrific scenes sure. and say, how could somebody do that? Well, they have to be mentally. They have to have a mental illness. That's right. After the the Las Vegas shooter, mm -hmm. you know, you say he had to be mentally ill. Right. No, no person in his right mind, mm -hmm. and this is what you hear people say, would do that. So we target mental illness mm -hmm. when mental illness, in fact, isn't the problem. So when you're right. when you're asking, when you when you ask, when anybody asks to keep the guns out of the hands of the mentally ill. Let's make sure that you understand exactly what you're talking about right. when we're talking about mental illness. I understand the question, mm -hmm. okay, but you're you're it, it's being phrased incorrectly. Right. And if you chase mental illness, if you if you target mental illness, you're going to be solving the wrong problem. Right. Okay. Right. It, it, you're you're just chasing the wrong thing. Right. Okay. So that's issue number one right is you're really not asking about mental illness you're asking another question right and we want to talk about what those other questions are right mm -hmm. the, the another issue another major issue is that there, there are no 
absolute ways to no. make mental illness, mental health diagnoses. That's right. The there first, are no lab tests. That's right. The first issue is diagnosis. Mm -hmm. You know, how do you how do you how do you make a mental illness diagnosis? Right. 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 And, and it's and it's <clears throat> clinical. It's you know you can't we we can't see how someone thinks. So right. all we can do is look at behaviors and look at trends and patterns of behavior and then make a clinical judgment based upon experience and, right. and, and understanding of, of um, human behavior. Yeah. That's but, the best that we have. Right. And when we use the term clinical diagnosis, it's a diagnosis based on observation. Mm -hmm. Okay. It, there is no lab test. There right. is no x-ray. There is no blood test. It's a diagnosis made by observation. You observe the symptoms, and right. if there's a sufficient number of them, then you make the diagnosis. Right. Now, I may not observe them directly. It may be somebody's family member mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. teacher or somebody else who knows the person, but somebody observes the symptom, right. and then you make the diagnosis. Right. So when we say clinical diagnosis, it's a diagnosis made through observation. Right. So, mm -hmm. so that introduces a great deal of uh, of subjectivity right. to to it, and, and I, I hate to say that um, as a clinician, but it's true. And, and so we have to rely, and, and that this is why it's so important that if you seek mental health treatment, that you seek treatment from someone who's knowledgeable and, and well-read and, and understands and right. some of these mental health issues. Because, you know, I mean, good grief, you know, somebody walks into, to, um, one office and says, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling. Uh, I have mood swings. They're going to walk out with a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Right. That may or probably isn't bipolar disorder. Right. Um, there, there are so many other facets many associated other with, right. with mood swings. And so it could be all kinds of other things, right. but if you don't have that experience and that, that understanding of what these conditions are, then you're going to misdiagnose and you're going to yeah. misidentify. I think, again, where we see this so often is with kids with ADHD, mm -hmm. okay? And you say, well, yes, this child has all the characteristics of ADHD, but it's not because they have some chemical imbalance. Right. It's because of the way they were raised, right. or it's because of environmental stressors, or it's because they're in the wrong grade, mm -hmm. or they have a mismatch with their teacher. And a clinician has to be astute enough to uncover mm -hmm. all those other right. possibilities. Right. And if you just go in and say, oh yeah, he, he, he looks like he has ADHD, mm -hmm. he's got these six things, let's make the diagnosis. Right. Premature. Right. Okay. Absolutely. And so we have to be very careful and in the hands of a skilled, so making a mental health, making a diagnosis of a mental illness, a mental disorder, mm -hmm. is a complex process right. and one that has to be done very carefully. Yeah. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, so th there's no there's no lab test, there's no blood test. Uh, there's a lot of people that talk about neuroimaging. Right. Um, and what about an MRI? What yeah. about a CT? What about functional MRI? What about all the stuff that Dr. Amen talks about? Right. And the things that you see in that are are, are <clears throat> neurological issues, but it's still and it and it's going to identify um, significant structural and functional problems. But there are many people who, who have mental mm -hmm. health issues that do not show anything through no neuroimaging. They have no abnormalities. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there are many people who have some abnormalities who show no symptoms. <laughs> so it, there's not, once again, there's not a one-to-one -one correlation there. It, right. it, it's not a, a, a perfect science. Right. And neuroimaging studies, at least as they exist today, um, are mainly used for research purposes. Mm -hmm. They're mm -hmm. not clinical tools right. yet, for, as far as mental illness is mm -hmm. concerned. If you're looking for structural abnormalities, yes. Right. But as far as mental illness, what we do is we look at a group of kids with ADHD right. and say, in this group, we found this. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're going to find it in every individual. Right. You're going to find it in a large group of, indi right. of, of people. Okay? Yeah. So it's an average number. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's where the variability comes right. in. Mm -hmm. and, and, and sometimes we can use neuroimaging um, on a confirmatory basis. Right. Um, because you can, if you see somebody with a certain clinical presentation, they can go have an MRI or a um, like a functional MRI or something like that done, mm -hmm. and say yes, everything is consistent with that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But the other way around doesn't work. You can't right. see somebody with that and say, ah, that person has schizophrenia. Right. Um, 
because pe- many people have some of those same structural structural mm-hmm. abnormalities. That's right. But don't have schizophrenia. They don't present this symptom. So it's right. it's there isn't a one to one correspondence, and we don't have a neuro we don't have an imaging technology right. that is diagnostic. Right. Okay. That's that's number. So right. so some people think that we do. Mm-hmm. You know, you can do a PET scan or a CT scan right. or an MRI and say, oh, there's the problem. No, that right. we don't have that kind of technology. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and the way that you know Dr. Amen and some of these other folks use it, it, it is clinical. Right. But what they see is okay. This is the clinical presentation. Mm-hmm. This is the way the brain looks um, on these neuroimaging studies. Right. Let's apply some interventions and see if we can make the brain look different. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's fine. But the, the neuroimaging isn't technically making the diagnosis. Right. He's right. looking at some aggregate <clears throat> data, he's looking at some consistencies. Oh, a lot of people with ADHD show this kind of right. structural uh, presentation, mm-hmm. but it's not diagnostic in and of itself. Yeah. We found, um, when I was at the University of Georgia, we did MRI studies, and right. we found these sort of common features among mm-hmm. uh, children. We did mostly children uh, with ADHD. Right. Okay. Not, but it's not diagnosed. You, right. Every every child with ADHD doesn't have this. Right. You know, on average, it's bit, the, the right frontal lobe is a little bit bigger, but not every child with mm-hmm. ADHD has that. So right. it, it can't be used diagnostically. Right. Useful information, but can't be used as a diagnostic tool. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And when you look at the functional stuff, that's uh, there's harder. a lot for treatment. Right. You know, right. it's good for treatment mm-hmm. stuff, but not diagnostic. Right. So. We're getting there, but it takes science to get there. It does take science and research. Um, yeah. So, but we got to... That's another research. research takes money. So there we are to money again. But um, do you have anything else for today? Tomorrow we're going to talk about the difference between diagnoses and symptoms. Right. Uh, because that, there's a, there's a big difference yeah. there. All we wanted to do today was to say, we understand the question that, that we want to, and we all agree, we want to keep the hands out mm-hmm. of... But we don't want to keep the hands out of people with mental illness. We want to keep the guns. Guns. Out of, yeah. you, say hands? you said the hands out of people. No, your hands <laughs> are safe, even with us. Um, we don't want to keep guns out of the hands of people with mental illness. We want to keep guns out of the hands of people who might. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's a very, very, very different question, right. and that's what we want to pick up tomorrow. Is how do we how do we identify those who are right. at risk? That probably has very little to do with mental illness. Right. In fact, um, so. Uh, that's what we'll be discussing tomorrow. Absolutely. Right? Okay. Yep. All right. So until then, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid. Thanks for sharing this episode of the Mental Breakdown and Psychridge podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you will find all of our previous podcasts and much more. We'd be honored if you would become a patron through patreon.com, where any donation you can manage will go to the development and creation of more content. Just visit patreon.com slash the mental breakdown for more information. Thanks again for listening. Have an awesome day, and we look forward to being back in your feed tomorrow morning.